Michelle Klimczak is a licensed master social worker with over 25 years of direct practice and administrative experience in the fields of child welfare, trauma, and interpersonal violence. She works with a statewide human services agency called The Connection, and that provides assistance with issues like homelessness, uh, mental illness, substance abuse, and community justice rehabilitation. So she's going to talk to us about how managers can recognize and also respond to significant behavioral warning signs that may be coming from their employees. This can be a source of stress for both the employees and the managers. So Michelle is going to talk us through that. Michelle, welcome. And you can start with your slides. Thank you so much. You could see the slides, correct? Yes, we can. OK, good. Okay. I want to say that the previous session was really the perfect segue into my session uh, because all of those factors that convince people that our place is a great place to work uh, and that contribute to retention are also critically important for employee mental health. So there's kind of an unbroken continuum. All right. So I'm going to start with a statistic. One in four adults will experience the symptoms of a mental health condition in any given year. So this is not a diagnosable mental illness. These are the symptoms of mental health conditions. I'll talk a little more about them shortly. And uh, by the way, that number was um, one in five prior to COVID. So we know that COVID didn't make the situation any better. One in 20 people are living with a chronic diagnosed mental health condition. 57% will not seek help. So not everyone living with a chronic mental health condition um, receives kind of ongoing care. But I have to say, even those who do, uh, they can have breakthrough episodes. But many people do not seek help. And if they do, it's not consistent. Depression alone is estimated to account for 200 million lost work days per year at a cost of up to $40 billion to employers. Depression has been identified as kind of the number one issue. And so the idea is <clears throat> no one is immune from mental health challenges and no amount of intelligence, success or willpower can shield someone from mental illness or from the challenges of severe um, emotional stress. <clears throat> so here's the question before us. We wouldn't hesitate to help someone who was in obvious physical distress. So why is mental distress different? Now that's a rhetorical question, but I really want us to think about it because it's something uh, that's often the elephant in the room, <clears throat> right? There are people, I call them, you know, the invisible walking wounded among us. And what are some of the reasons why mental health is so very, very different from physical health? Well, one of the reasons is we don't want to pry or offend. Okay, for, for some of us, these would be factors that might make us hesitate to reach out to someone. This kind of fear that someone may snap with no warning or that it's almost like a superstitious fear that if we bring it up, we're gonna make it worse, which of course is, is not true, but there's that hesitancy there. There's also shame associated with mental health. Uh, stigma, a lot of stigma that We've come a long way, but I, I still think that mental health problems are surrounded by a lot of stigma, shame, and fear. Uh, and so some of us might not want to have these conversations if we're noticing something wrong because we don't want to embarrass someone. But really, it's we're the ones who are embarrassed often. Feeling helpless or powerless. You know, what can I do? I, I'm just one person. I, I, I can't really do anything about it. Lack of knowledge is a huge stumbling block. And also not having a plan 
if people do confide in you, right? It's almost one of those issues where you almost don't want to ask the question because you don't want to hear the answer. And so hopefully at least these last two factors uh, we're going to address today. So the idea is that mental health is everyone's business. The problem is really too widespread, too complex to think that, and let's focus on the work environment, that posting the EAP number kind of fulfills our obligations in terms of uh, our employees' mental health. And it, it, it was interesting to me that, I don't know if anybody reads the Times, gets, gets the New York Times, on Sunday, they had a whole section devoted to mental health. And the focus was not, uh, you know, individual sufferers. The focus was kind of our collective responsibility and the social impacts of, of mental health. And so I, I just want to read a quote, quote from it. Mental health is a personal experience, but it is also something very much shaped by the world around us. And so if we think about the work environment where most of us spend most of our time, most of our hours, we can improve our collective mental health only if we recognize that the problems and the solutions are all of ours to share. And so I, I, I wanna put today's training in that, in that context. And I wanna focus on the fact that we're all human. And so anyone with a mind has mental health, a level of mental health or mental unwellness. And there's a continuum. So what I really want to stress uh, is that, you know, the focus here is, is on red flags. I'm gonna get to red flags, but we're not immune to those red flags as managers. You know, we're all human beings. And when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about our, our common humanity. And so as I'm gonna go through some of those red flags, um, we have to be conscious of those in ourselves, right? We're gonna talk a little bit about self-care, but a big part of self-care is knowing when we might be getting to a place where we're becoming overwhelmed. And so in terms of, of this continuum of, of mental health, again, we're all here somewhere. Right in, in the middle is what we call euthymia in, in the field. And that's kind of, it's kind of a Zen state, okay? And we don't always wanna be euthymic because we probably wouldn't get anything done, right? We, we need a certain level of stress maybe to motivate us. But the idea here is that there's a continuum on, on both sides, uh, which would fall into what we call the normal range, all right? Nobody, has the same mood every second of, of the day. That's not normal. We would be robots. And then we go into mental health conditions, which are different than um, a diagnosable mental illness. And so that's that one in four, all right? That, that one in four figure that um, some of us might experience mild depression. Some of us might experience times when we're sort of hyperactive and, and what does that look like for us, all right? But it's still within a range that it's not going to impact our day-to-day -day functioning. And that's really the criteria uh, of a mental health disorder or diagnosis, right? If, if something falls into that category, one of the criteria is that the problems that the person is having have reached a point where it is impacting functioning, where it's impacting functioning. And so when we talk about red flags, which we're gonna to get to, um, these are the kind of things that we as managers are gonna have our eyes out for because we're looking at performance, right? We're seeing people in one environment, but any kind of serious mental health condition or, or problem is going to play out in all aspects of their lives. We're just kind of seeing this one bit. And so when should you be concerned, right? Because this is about being concerned. And so I, I wanna start by talking about the difference between risk factors and warning signs. And I think this is really important. So when we talk about risk factors of any kind, risk factors increase the probability of a certain outcome over time, but they cannot predict 
short-term outcomes. Risk factors can be static, so that's <clears throat> family history, personal history, or dynamic, current, open to change, fluctuations, such as um, divorce, grief, or loss of a job. And warning signs or red flags are recent changes in behavior or functioning. So this is what we're going to be focusing on, right? Recent changes that are a cause for concern and may indicate the need for uh, intervention. And so, you know, just to illustrate the difference between risk factors and warning signs, let's take heart, heart disease. So risk factors for heart disease, we all know, poor diet, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, a lot of stress, all those things, okay? Now, a lot of us are walking around with all that stuff and we're not having heart attacks. So warning signs, if our uh, you know, pain in the arm radiating up, up to the jaw, right? Impending sense of doom, crushing chest pain. So those warning signs are definitely indications that something needs to be done. So what we're gonna be focusing on today are of course, warning signs, these, these red flags, but we might be in a position, you know, the longer that we've known someone to know about some risk factors, you know, someone's going through a very difficult divorce. You might happen to know that. And so that in the presence of warning signs might be uh, a strong indication that some kind of intervention might be warranted. And so when we're talking about red flags, we're talking about observable behavior. And this is important, right? We're not making assumptions. We're not diagnosing. It looks like you are, you know, in a manic phase of borderline. No, we're not diagnosing. But what we're focusing on is what we observe, what, what we are experiencing of their behavior with our five senses. So we're kind of focusing on the facts. And as managers and, and also, you know, colleagues who uh, interact with our coworkers on a daily basis, we're noticing changes. So what you're looking for are changes, changes, right? Because that would indicate someone maybe going into a phase where they might be in trouble, right? So we're looking for changes in behavior and performance that are uncharacteristic of that individual. So if someone normally is always late, not performing, you know, some of the things that I'm going to go through. Well, that's a different kind of problem, right? As you know, that's, that's an HR problem. But if someone is normally not doing those things and now they're acting very differently, that's a big red flag. Changes in physical appearance. Problems with uh, regulating emotion, right? Someone who normally presents as fairly stable and, you know, has it together is, is, is all of a sudden very um, emotional, whether that looks like shut down or they're very, um, you know, reactive, more reactive than usual. And also we're going to be looking at thought patterns. Now you might say, well, how do we know what someone's thinking by their speech, by what they're saying? And there's very characteristic speech of someone who is maybe for instance, um, psychotic. And the factors that we're going to consider are frequency, duration, and impact. So in terms of frequency, right, uh, are these symptoms and things that we're noticing happening for most of the day, right? So it's not just that like something happened and, and they, you know, got upset, but then it's over. Is it a pattern? And has that pattern been going on for a while? All right, so we don't want to jump in if someone's having a bad day. But again, the more that we know someone, you know, and as I was listening to the prior session, um, you know, re remote work makes this a little bit more of a, of a challenge, right? When you're in the office, seeing each other, having that, um, you know, physical contact, it's, it's, it's a lot easier, I would think, to notice these things. But you still notice them, even if all your meetings are on Teams or Zoom. And then impact. All right. Is what you are observing interfering with work performance, work relationships, and or projects? Right. Has it reached the point where now it's significantly impacting the work? 
And so you're probably saying, what is this? Well, I just want to talk about this for one second, because we're talking about red flags and, and warning signs. And what we're going to be talking about uh, is kind of a progression, right? From someone from maybe early changes, later changes, and then an actual crisis situation. And we're going to be talking about, you know, what if people are getting aggressive? And so the idea here is that regardless of the diagnosis, the label, we're not here to diagnose. I want us to start thinking in terms of this process that happens in all of our bodies all the time. It's happening for us right now. Our primitive nervous systems are always scanning the environment for safety and danger. And it skews very heavily in the direction of danger. And so if someone is in a crisis, what we call a crisis situation, they're in fight, flight, or freeze mode. And I, I think you've all probably heard of fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, it's a very primitive mechanism hardwired into our nervous systems. And the idea is that um, someone who is having a significant mental health crisis is absolutely going into fight, flight, or freeze. And what happens in fight, flight, or freeze is that our rational brains really stop functioning. And all of the body's energy is going into fighting, which might look like aggression, fleeing or freezing, kind of literally being in a, in a frozen state. And as helpers, I'm going to call us helpers, right, as, as managers, as people trying to assist, we have to recognize and talking about self-care that the physical, the physiological reactions that go along with that person being in a crisis state are transferred to us because this is how human beings are made, right? And so if someone is going into fight, flight, or freeze mode, this is what's happening for their body. They're, they are reacting and they might literally be breathing very heavily, sweating, shaking. Things are happening with their digestion because that whole process is shutting down problems concentrating, uh, you know, irritable, all these things. We also go into that state if we're trying to help someone, right? Because emotions are contagious. Emotions are, are contagious. So I'm going to talk a little bit about crisis de-escalation. The important thing to keep in mind uh, is that it's so important for us to try to be as much as possible in our green zone. The green zone is where we are connected. We are engaged, right? We heard that word a lot from the last session. Uh, we are trying to engage with a person in crisis, right? We're not trying to shut them down because their primitive brains are already primed. And look at that dotted red line. When someone is really going into fight, flight, or freeze, muscles in their ears literally shut down. They're not listening to a lot of talk, 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 right? They're looking for a safe person to engage and connect with. And hopefully that will be us. So in terms of some early changes, all right, in behavior, we might see an emerging pattern of being late, canceling, canceling appointments or forgetting about commitments. Now again, this happens to everybody, but is it becoming a pattern? Is it happening often? Missing deadlines, declining work quality, a reluctance to take on new challenges. So if someone before, you know, didn't have any problem saying, hey, you know, I know you've got a lot on your plate, but can you do this? No, you know, I can't. Kind of shutting down very, very quickly. Maybe enjoying travel before, but, but now they, they really don't want to do that anymore. Failure to complete tasks in a timely manner not returning emails and calls, kind of going AWOL. And this, again, is, is a challenge with remote work too, right? You, you can't kind of go into their office. So it's like, what's happening with them? There will be physical changes as well. Physical health and mental health are very closely intertwined. And so there's really no way that someone can be going through a significant mental health crisis and you're not going to see it manifest in their physical um, well-being too. 
And so is someone especially tired looking? Do they look, uh, you know, disheveled if that's not how they normally look? Poor grooming. Th these are huge signs of uh, depressive states, you know, and in general, just not looking like themselves. You know, are they um, unkempt? Now, you might say, well, if we're doing all remote work, how do we how do we see these things? Just last week, um, I, I have a friend who who said, you know, I, I was on a Zoom meeting and, you know, there was a clinician on the call. We're all very concerned about her. You know, she she just looked, you know, she, you know, she said she looked terrible and she didn't mean she didn't mean uh, having a bad hair day. She said, we're, we're all very concerned. Plus, she hasn't been returning our calls. She, you know, she's not herself. And so these, again, are kind of early warning signs what might be going on. In terms of emotional changes, negative affect, a negative attitude. So not that uh, employee that someone had a question about who's always negative, right? But someone who's normally positive, all of a sudden becoming more negative and pessimistic becoming very defensive when uh, you might make a suggestion, correction, or, or a criticism, very irritable, appearing to be sad, increasing anxiety, and, and also apathy, like Ugh, nothing matters. And in terms of thought processes, difficulty concentrating or, or focusing, uh, appearing to be distracted, appearing to be indecisive, and also carelessness. Again, that is not characteristic of them in general. Worsening signs would be withdrawing from colleagues, lack of participation in meetings. And you know, we talked about this, you know, either they're missing work, missing a lot of days of work, or or presenteeism. It's kind of you're there, but but you're not there. There's a way of that happening, uh, you know, the quiet quitting. Uh, where someone is just kind of checked out and it's, and it's not about mental health, but again, you know, how do I know when it's about mental health or when should I be concerned? Um, you know, in combination with all of these other changes, you know, they're just kind of showing up, but they're not really there. They can't concentrate. Something is going on. Odd or erratic behavior, extreme talkativeness, very long emails with, with random detail. This, um, has actually happened, you know, where uh, there's a disorder called bipolar disorder and someone in the manic phase of bipolar disorder, you know, what does that look like at work? What does that look like at work? And one of the ways that we knew this colleague who, who, was, who was very open about having bipolar disorder was going, was what we call, you know, hypomanic because a true manic phase um, sometimes involves psychosis and that's a medical emergency. But we sort of knew when he was um, hypomanic because he would send long emails, very, very long emails kind of going off on, on tangents. I mean, they were brilliantly written. He, he was a genius, but um, it's like, oh, something's happening here, you know? And so again, something out of behavior, um, out of their normal behavior pattern easily overwhelmed with change of any kind. You know, uh, a mark of resilience is you could sort of roll with the punches, roll with the changes. And if change is becoming very hard, that's a sign. And again, I, I, I just wanna stress that this is not something that happens to other people, right? We all are susceptible to um, mental health conditions, to various kinds of stress in our, in our lives. And so if, you know, I, I just, if we see this in, in ourselves, we might want to take a look inward and say, what's happening with me? And we all have our own pattern of stress, right? Like, what does that look like for me? Do I tend to become discombobulated and disorganized? You know, what does it look like for me? Do I kind of shut my office door and not want to see people at all when normally I'm out there talking to people? In terms of physical appearance, again, declining hygiene, dressing inappropriately. Sometimes uh, with, with some disorders, um, someone might come to work and, and this happened too, dressed very provocatively. And again, it's not a matter of saying you're dressed inappropriately. It's like noticing 
this is not characteristic of that person or someone who seems to be wearing the same clothes four days in, in a row is actually um, can be a sign of serious depression or, or even of psychosis. Cuts or bruises in various stages of healing. This could indicate um, domestic violence or it could indicate self-harm. Or it could indicate that they're going to CrossFit. And I, I say that because I once had a case manager who had bruises all over her arms and legs. And it got to the point where, you know, I, I said to her, you know, are you all right? Your, your body is covered with bruises. And it turned out that she was going to CrossFit and slipping off the box and scratching her leg. And I'm like, oh, is that really good for you? But anyway, I checked in because something was happening that we could all see. Dramatic weight loss, dramatic weight loss, and sort of a, a haggard, very, very stressed appearance. Emotional changes, increasing sadness, expressions of hopelessness or despair, increasing anxiety, frequent expressions of anger or rage, again, that are very uh, uncharacteristic of that person, or appearing to be shut down in a way that just strikes us. And, you know, I want to stress, if you think something might be wrong, you know, go with your gut. And we're going to talk about how to have that conversation. You know, it's, it's not like there's one checklist that, you know, well, five of these, yes, three of those, no. If you're really getting a sense that something's wrong, if you're, if you're really concerned, have a conversation. And thought processes, self-blame, or, you know, grandiosity, which sometimes goes along with bipolar disorder. Their mind seems to go blank. You're kind of talking to them in, in a meeting maybe, and they're just not there for, for a second. Confusion, disorientation, paranoia and, and suspicion uh, is, is a big sign of um, something happening, something happening. And what we call flight of ideas. Flight of ideas is not just talkativeness. It's um, someone is talking and talking and talking, and this reminds them of that. And so now they're on that topic, and then they're on another topic. So it's like their, their mind is like literally going in 20 different directions at once. And so in terms of a possible crisis situation, moving from an employee who's irritated to angry and aggressive. And the first thing that we have to realize is that um, aggression is not necessarily violence. Okay, so verbal aggression can be a raised voice, yelling, posturing, maybe banging on the table, getting in another person's personal space, being really confrontational or making threatening statements. Um, and these aggressive behaviors are most often triggered and based in some kind of fear. There's some kind of fear going on. And so the first thing I wanna say is if at any time you fear for your safety, the person's safety or the safety of anyone around, you call 911 if someone is getting aggressive to the point that it might spill over into violence. But here's the thing, even if you call 911 or someone's calling 911, you still have an angry person in front of you. And so you have to attempt to de-escalate the situation. And so this takes, remember, they're in their fight, flight, or freeze mode. Our bodies want us to go there too, because no one likes to be in the position of being screamed at, especially when the things that are being said might be terrible things about us. All right. And so to de-escalate those kind of situations, we have to remain calm. We have to breathe. I want to talk about breathing at, at the end and focus on listening, focus on listening. And that's really important because uh, I think we tend to jump into interrupting them, um, you know, disagreeing, uh, never yell back ever because that will trigger them even more. We listen. And when we speak, we have to speak in a calm, non-threatening voice because they're just going by their primitive brain telling them danger, danger. So anything that we do that's going to contribute to that sense of you're in trouble, you're in danger, 
is going to make things much worse. Never say calm down because that's the opposite. That's sort of being condescending and never in the history of the world really has that worked, right? If someone's really upset, calm down. You just need to calm down. Well, they don't need to, they're upset. And so that's not the right thing to do. Don't be condescending, like you need to lower your voice. You know, I can't hear you when, when you're yelling because that also tends to um, strike people as not helpful or certainly threatening. You know, if you don't quiet down, I'm calling security. And maybe you're going to call security. Maybe someone already has called security. But <laughs> true de-escalation is not getting defensive. It's not being threatening. It is actually trying to engage. And again, I can't stress enough. If you feel like you're in physical danger, leave the room, remove yourself from that situation. But if someone is just really upset and you don't feel in physical danger, you know, it, try to engage with them and you engage by listening. What is happening for them? What is going on? Listen and validate whatever's happening. I'm going to talk about validation in, in a second. So a true crisis is active psychosis. This is a legitimate medical emergency. It's, it's probably criteria for being um, admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And our task in this case would be to call for help and keep the person calm and safe until help arrives. And so the idea with psychosis is that someone has totally lost touch with reality. All right, they are totally withdrawn. You're talking to them and there's a blank stare. Um, extremely confused or disorganized speech. Um, inability to carry out basic functions. Extreme suspicion. Uh, you know, I worked for years in foster care and, and what this looked like for one of the children that I worked with, he, uh, I went to a home visit and he was terrified that people in black cars were, were following him and that he, they were going to kill him. Someone in there was going to kill him. And, you know, we had a call 211. Very limited flat affect, extreme vacillations in um, emotionality, going from rage, sadness to maybe laughing, delusions, voicing very unusual beliefs or um, ideas like they're a movie star. Some, some people think that they're Jesus. I mean, when, when someone is talking like this, I don't think it takes a training to, to tell you that this person has lost touch with reality and, and it is a true medical emergency. Um, hallucinations. Sometimes people see visions or, or they hear voices and they're just acting um, irrationally. And so the key to both aggression and you know, psychosis, uh, you have to deescalate until help arrives. And with psychosis, we're going to call 911 and we have to be the safe person. You know, I like that term, be the safe person for the individual in crisis, deescalate until help arrives. So how we initially respond to someone in crisis is so critical. You know, the, the first things that we say or do can really set the tone of I am a safe person I am here to help you. We're trying to move them back to their green zone. We're trying to move them back to their safe state. And so we have to be calm. We have to be confident. We can't act scared and, and, and nervous. We might be feeling it inside, but we have to project, you are safe with me. Not I'm gonna control you, but you are safe with me. So we, we, we wanna use simple, short sentences. We wanna speak in a gentle, non-threatening tone. Never argue with someone who is delusional or attempt to tell them that they're wrong. All right, so uh, if someone feels that they're being followed, right, our gut would be to say, well, no, you're not. Well, I, I'm looking out the window. I don't, I don't see those black cars. And actually that's what, you know, the foster mother was, was saying. And again, his primitive brain perceived that as you're wrong, you're lying, I don't believe you. And so the, you know, the thing to say is that must be really scary. Tell me about it. When did you first start noticing this? You know, you have to get on their wavelength. If someone is in a psychotic state, you have to get on their wavelength. And the thing not to do is to say, well, you're not being rational. Of course, you're not being rational. They're psychotic. And so 
get on their wavelength and help calm them down and focus on what's important to them by listening to understand. In terms of validation, a lot of us know this term, and I, we actually do a two-hour validation training because very few people do validation correctly. Validation is uh, communicating to someone that their responses make sense and are understandable given their current situation. It's a refusal to treat someone as bad, crazy, irrational, or wrong, regardless of how they are behaving. Now, you might say, well, but if they're behaving, you know, um, irrationally, how can I validate that? Now, remember, we're talking about here crisis de-escalation, right? So we're not talking about everyone's calm in a meeting and someone is projecting, uh, I don't know, profits that are never going to happen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone who is just is losing touch with reality very rapidly. It, It conveys that we care about them. We have what we call unconditional positive regard. And we're conveying that we're here to help. We are here to help. And so this is how most people validate. I could see you're upset, but you really need to lower your voice because you're scaring everyone. Well, I, I hear what you're saying, but. And so my strong advice is lose the but. Because what does but do? Well, even in grammar, The purpose of but is to negate what came before it. So when we're validating, leave the but out of it. (laughs) Leave the but out of it, right? I could see you're very upset. Uh, You know, tell me about the black cars following you. What's going on? Get on their wavelength. Let them do most of the talking. We can't talk someone out of being psychotic. And in terms of another crisis situation, suicide suicidal or homicidal ideation. And so the red flags here, kind of classic, expressions of hopelessness, feeling trapped, giving up, wanting to be dead, expressing severe emotional distress and pain. Sometimes asking about life insurance payout policies, especially as it relates to cause of death, right? Um, is, is, Is a warning sign. Some policies don't pay out for suicide making very clear verbal statements that they intend to harm themselves or someone else. The person is in a state of extreme despair, high agitation or rage, especially in the presence of intoxication. The combination of despair, high uh, agitation and rage and intoxication is really a perfect storm for something bad happening. So if someone is in front of you, for some reason arrives at work in, in this state, you would wanna call 911 right away. And then there's talking, writing, or posting on social media about death, dying, or getting revenge against someone. And, um, you know, we hear about all these incidents, which scare so many of us. And, you know, and if you look back, a lot of them advertised on social media exactly what was going through their mind and exactly what they were planning to do. So in terms of suicide, I spoke before about risk factors. Some things that you might know about that might um, increase danger. So in combination, those statements in combination uh, with the recent loss of a loved one, you know, a a significant loss, divorce or separation, a loss of custody, right? Domestic violence, whether they're a survivor or perpetrator, a mental illness in combination with social isolation, a recent reversal of fortune and recent release from a psychiatric, uh, from a psychiatric hospitalization. Not, not many people know this, but the number one risk period for people in terms of suicide is being recently released from a psychiatric hospital. And that's really sad and shocking for some families because you think, well, they got the help they need. They're in the hospital, they're on medication. Now they're out. And, you know, the mechanism is that if someone was sort of really convinced that they want to take their life. Um, They sort of have the energy now to buy a weapon and to follow those steps to actually take their life. So it's a known risk period for um, suicide. And so if someone is actively suicidal, you need to call 911. Safety is the priority. And there's, I'm also going to give you the number of a suicide hotline 
Um, because again, before help arrives, you might want to call the suicide hotline for them and have them talk to a trained suicide counselor. You also might want to check your, your uh, company policy regarding calling their um, emergency contact. But really say to the employee, given what you've told me, I'm very concerned about your safety. And I, I just want to get you immediate help because your safety is the most important thing to me right now. Keep saying the word safe and safety, because that's really what it's all about. It's about their safety. And when you call 911, give all the details of what was said and, and, and shared with you. Um, and when emergency responders arrive, make sure that you tell them what was said, because sometimes um, people don't want to go to the hospital. They have every intention of taking their own life but they don't want to go to the hospital. So they'll say, oh, you know, you know, never mind. I no, I was just I was just lying. And so your statements, your very honest statements about what made you call them in the first place will help the first responders make a decision if this person needs to be um, evaluated at a psychiatric hospital. So how do you have the difficult conversation? Most I would wager to think that most things that happen at work aren't these very extreme situations. They can happen, certainly. But most often, we're gonna, it's, it's going to be with those low-level, mid-level concerns, right? And so I like this quote from Mark Brackett, um, and we've actually worked with him here. He's from Yale's Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's one of the great paradoxes of the human condition. We ask some variation of the question, how are you feeling over and over, which would lead one to assume that we attach some importance to it, yet we never expect or desire or provide an honest answer. And so, you know, to go back to um, the last presentation, this idea of engagement and creating a creating managerial practices where there is this level of engagement so that it sort of sets the tone of, it's okay to talk about these things with me. I'm a safe person. It's a lot easier to do that when there's a foundation of engagement than when there's kind of a hands-off and business-only uh, environment where really no one feels safe talking about it. And honestly, that's a big problem with first responders. I've done a lot of trainings with self-care for first responders. And um, in that culture, it's just not okay to talk about mental health. And they're all struggling at one level or another. Uh, and so um, there's a lot more realization that creating a culture of it's okay to talk about these things. And so, you know, what are our own bias about mental health? You know, true or false? Everyone who is experiencing a mental health challenge needs to see a, a professional. That's not necessarily true. A variety of professionals can help a person who is experiencing a mental health challenge. Absolutely true. There's a wide range of help out there. Advice and information are the same thing, false. And so what we don't want to do is give people advice. We want to listen to them and give them information and resources. And you may need to adjust how you approach a person depending on your relationship with them. Absolutely true. So how do you have this conversation? We've noticed some of the warning signs. How do we have this difficult conversation? Well, the first thing is don't wait for the perfect moment. Don't wait. You know, if, if you're worried, reach out, reach out. And plan to put enough time aside for this conversation. It's not a quick conversation, not a water cooler conversation. It's not something that you maybe want other people to hear. Really carve out some time in a private place free of distractions to have this very important conversation. Your nonverbal communication will be as significant as your words. You want someone to really feel like they're the center of your attention because you're concerned and you care about them. So if someone does disclose emotional distress, be prepared with a plan to address their particular situation. So if you already have these concerns, someone's not turning any of, of their work and they're you know, anxious, all of those signs, um, you might want to think beforehand, can I lighten their workload? You know, come kind of preloaded with some kind of plan based on, um, you know, if someone is really in distress. And also be prepared that they might not open up to you immediately and just let them know, I am here if you ever want to talk. We are here to support you. 
And so setting the tone is really important for these conversations. And, you know, the model is ask, join, and commit. It shouldn't come across as a performance review, as a, as a performance issue, as a coaching session, or a disciplinary issue, right? Because you've been looking at this constellation of things happening that you, you know, that you are concerned for their well-being. You're not concerned because they didn't turn in last week's report. All right. And we're not imposing our assumptions. We're talking about what we're observing. We're sharing our observations. And I like this phrase. Our attitude is compassionate curiosity. Think safety, safety. So what not to say? I'm sure everything's okay, but I'm just checking in. Well, that's, you know, I I think you could see that that statement, and I know you would never consider doing something foolish like taking your own life wouldn't make people want to say, actually, I am thinking of that. Cause it's like, oh, I know you would never do something like that or guilt trips. Think about your family or we need you here. You know, that's kind of crazy. If someone's thinking of taking their life, um, they're well past those points or overreacting. If someone discloses that they have a mental health condition, oh, I never would have known. I'm shocked. All right. Or judging. Well, I know you're upset, but you're really not handling this well. You know, you might be depressed, but you, you, you also are, are not performing. No, that, we can't judge how people are handling their mental health crisis. You used to be so positive and, and productive, and now look what's happening. You could see how that's not helpful, right? And I hope this isn't about the raise you didn't get. None of these things would make someone want to confide in us that they might need help and support. And what's the difference between help and, uh, you know, advice? So let's say someone is going through, you know, a breakup. Well, I remember during my breakup, I just threw myself right back into work. And what you should do is, no, we don't want to, we don't want to tell people what to do. Breakups can be tough. It's natural for you to be hurt and upset. I could see how that's, how you're thinking about this during the day. You really need to talk about a professional versus I'm here for you if you ever want to talk. There are people who are trained to help you work through this. You'll get over it. Just don't worry about it. You are not alone, right? Never minimize someone's suffering. And again, don't tell them that the way that they're handling it isn't healthy. We say, I really care about you and I've noticed these changes. And the idea is that when people feel heard and safe, they're ready to consider options. And so please have some options ready. Right. So if they're struggling to perform job tasks, can you reduce their workload or the flexible schedule? Maybe they need to take a medical leave Offer choice because choice is uh, healing. Choice is the antidote to trauma where people feel like they have no choice and they're kind of cornered and they're worried about losing their job. I mean, honestly, imagine having a diagnosable mental illness and they're struggling and now they might lose their job because they're not performing. They're, they're in a panic mode. And so, you know, speaking of that, um, our job, our role is to demonstrate our commitment to the person through this crisis and beyond. We have to resist the effort to make promises that we can't keep, right? Well, no matter what happens, you'll always have your job here. Who knows? Maybe they'll become incapacitated and won't even be able to work. So we have to resist the effort, uh, the um, impulse to kind of make quick promises because that's not good either, but it's never wrong to remind them that they have a caring community supporting them. And in terms of, just a couple more slides, in terms of self-disclosure, I don't know how you feel about sharing your own lived experiences of maybe mental health struggles. Uh, It's extremely impactful in terms of overcoming isolation and shame. There's nothing more powerful in terms of overcoming shame than someone saying, look, I went, I went through this too. And you're, you're not saying it to say, and I know exactly what you're going through because no one knows exactly what another human being is, is going through. Everyone's experience is, is unique. Um, if you choose to disclose, you know, um, what's not helpful is sort of war stories. Well, when I had my breakdown, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's not helpful. And, or, or talking about bad outcomes, Um, And it shouldn't be about us, right? Employees shouldn't end up comforting us. But uh, if you choose to self-disclose, it could be a very powerful way to, you know, to just break down stigma. And again, it speaks to that culture of um, 
can we talk about being human and not just talk about the job? And so just two slides on self-care, you know, we, we, we need to prioritize self-care at all times, you know, not just obviously if we've been screamed at by an irate um, employee. And, you know, to go back to that slide of, of the green zone, red zone, um, what happens is most of us spend most of our days in the yellow anxious zone, which means that our nervous systems are never turned off. They're never totally calm down. We're always in a state of, uh, state of kind of low chronic stress, and that's really not healthy. And in terms of if we do go through a, a very traumatic um, de-escalation, let's say, the best self-care advice that I could give you is that you have to be prepared uh, that your body is going to react. There's a name for it. There's a medical term. It's called acute stress response. So don't expect to just go on with work and not feel differently because stress is ha happens to us on a physiological level. And if you've gone through stress, that's traumatic enough. It will show. You might shake afterwards. You might not be able to stop thinking about it. Think back to that slide of sort of early warning signs. You can't concentrate. Uh, irritability. You might have all of those symptoms that are totally normal. The body has to come down. The body has to wind down. And what that looks like for you is, is going to be very personal. Some people from that rush of adrenaline need to just go outside and walk, literally walk it off. Some people need to go more into their free state and just sort of be alone. Um, talking about it is very helpful. At The Connection, we have a, a staff crisis response team that we are trained in helping staff. You know, we work with a lot of very challenging client populations and, uh, you know, things happen. And I'm, I'm a member of the staff response team because talking about it does help because it's our rational brains trying to make sense of what just happened to us. But mostly, you know, cut yourself slack. It's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm going to tell this to you, breathe. And I am the biggest person of, oh, please don't tell me to breathe. I can't stand things like this. But let me tell you, breathing is the only um, automatic function of our body that we can control. And it brings, it literally calms the nervous system. It's so important, so important to breathe. It literally forcefully calms down your body. Your mind might still be thinking about it, but breathing calms down your body. You could Google techniques. The idea is to exhale more than you inhale. And the last slide um, was really everything that the previous presenters talked about, that creating a safety culture is what's really most important uh, because it, it creates a safe space for people to have these conversations. So in an organization where everyone feels connected, where there's a culture of kindness, where there's a learning orientation so that when people make mistakes, the attitude is what can we learn from this and not who's in trouble and who can we blame? You know, flexibility, um, some kind of supervision where you're checking in with how people are. How are they? Not just what are they doing? And of course, policies and practices that promote well being. And so these are some numbers um, that, again, if someone is suicidal, you might want to call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline until help comes. Uh, Connecticut has 211. You, you might want to call 211 if someone's having a mental health crisis and they will be connected to a mental health professional. Sometimes 911 will connect you to 211. So if in doubt, always call 911. And um, Mental Health First Aid has a free crisis text line. Uh, this is one of the trainings that, that we do. And so that's, that's the end. This is who I am. Uh, I'm the senior director of training at our uh, organization. And we do a lot of, we train many uh, organizations in, in a lot of different things, one of which is mental health first aid uh, and, and self-care. So I'm sorry I went over. But no, you're, not, you're, you're all good. Um, so I've got a question for you, and it has to do with um, how do you, how would a manager know when to call 911 as opposed to when to call the police? I mean, how do you differentiate between 
this person needs help for their own mental health issue versus we're all in a lot of danger right now and we want him to be taken away like we think he should we think the yeah. police need to be involved. I mean how do you so, figure that out so really I don't think we you know we don't always have to make those decisions and so um our our policy here and sort of standard policy is to call 911 and let the operator decide who who should go out right okay. we, we don't necessarily want to be responsible for those decisions uh and so tell the 911 operator what's happening and they will decide okay. right and so yeah it's it's um we don't have to decide you know who should i call if there's a a real emergency they will figure out who to send out okay um and uh, I, I'm going to answer a question, a legal question that came in before yeah. we break. Um, as managers, leaders, do we have an option really legally that allow us to ask about mental health? So that's the answer to that is actually pretty long and complicated. So I'll just summarize it for you in the minute that we have left. Um, the thing to remember is that so in that context we're talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and this is something we were talking about with Nick Zeno as well the thing about that law is that what it does is it prohibits you from discriminating against people with disabilities or with mental health issues it doesn't prevent you from helping them um, and so when you remember what Michelle was talking about earlier about um, um, telling the person that you're noticing something factual about them. Like I know, I, I notice, I notice that you're behaving differently. I, you, whatever that is, whatever those facts are, it is legal for you to approach an employee and say, I notice you may be having trouble. I notice you're behaving this way or that way. I notice whatever it is that, that was on Michelle's list that you think is indicative of a problem. You can mention that. You might, if you're a manager, you might want to talk to human resources ahead of time so that you can do what Michelle said, which was have a plan. So like, let's say um, you want to be able to say to this person, would a lower workload, would, would fewer tasks help? Would a lower workload help? Would a different schedule help? It would be perhaps uh, if you can arrange this ahead of time so that you could say to that employee, I notice you're having trouble, would a different workload help or would a different work schedule help? All that is perfectly legal. Um, if, you, if your company does not want to provide that assistance or, or wants more information, that's where it gets a little more complicated and you that's where this turns into a whole nother webinar where we're talking about having all you need to know is that as an employer, you have a legal responsibility. If you think someone is struggling with, it could be depression or anxiety or some other disability, your responsibility is to have a conversation with them. And then you talk about whether they might need a doctor's note in order to get an accommodation. Okay. So, but your first responsibility is to approach them, have a discussion, tell them you're noticing something, tell them that you'd like to help, and then you take it from there. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, brilliant. And, and I just want to add, you know, the purpose of these, of the conversation isn't to kind of get them to disclose, and we're, we're certainly not saying it, you know, it's, I, I am noticing this, I am concerned about you, I want to support you, help me, help me figure out how, how I can do that. And, and, you know, what do you see happening? So it's not like we're asking them, you know, right. do you have a mental illness? I can't help right. noticing. Right. right. So, right. Yeah, you would not want to say that. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> All right. So Michelle, thanks so much. You're That's welcome. there's so much there. That's um, so like we said before, everyone's going to get a copy of the slides. There's a lot in these slides to kind of study and learn more about and you can talk contact Michelle you'll see through her last slide how to get in touch with her um, so we're at the end of the webinar I would like to say thank you again to all of our speakers we've got Curtis Larson Carmody Torrance CLA and the connection thanks to Lauren Calhoun for producing a seamless webinar um, I would like people to just know that um, 
CBIA will be putting on an in-person event on November 3rd. And that is geared, this, this particular webinar is really geared towards managers and interpersonal relationships and how to interact with your employees. Our in-person event on November 3rd is really geared more towards business owners and HR managers. It's an employment law conference. And so we'll be talking about sexual harassment, how to prevent that, how to address those complaints, um, what you need to know about FMLA, what you need to know about uh, recent uh, laws that went into effect that went into effect this year. So I hope to see some of you guys there. If you'd like to register for that, you can do that on our website. Um, but other than that, I'll say thank you again, Lauren, thanks for all your help and uh, have a good afternoon.